Welcome to Oregon Rooted. I'm Higher Peaks. And this is Lady Sativa. You're listening to The Dirt Show. Where we bring you Oregon's cannabis culture. Welcome to The Dirt Show, episode 12. Episode I'm, 12. Yeah, this is Higher Peaks. And this is Lady Sativa. And we are there on episode 12. So, welcome, thank you, and let's do a little summary. We're going to talk about a little news as usual, and then we are going to... I'm going to do a little talk on some IPM. We don't... We haven't done a lot of talk on specific IPM. You know, we talk about pesticides and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I want to um, talk about natural biological ways of dealing with this stuff because we get a lot of people that prefer that. Mm -hmm. A lot of Oregonians really um, dig the whole natural, don't use the pesticides. <clears throat> We've also heard Jason from Kenevere talk about how if you can completely avoid pesticides that that's the best option right yeah so right. these are biological ways and also things you can do that uh, uh, are more natural and it, it really goes in deep so normally I'd say get your medicine get your bowl your blunt your bong your pipe whatever it is you do <laughs> do what you gotta do but you might also want to grab some notes this time because i've got some good information to share but it's a little detailed so i'll try to keep it layman <laughs> but if for the listeners that want to get deep into biologicals and beneficials um this is it's it gets deep right <laughs> so anyway we got some news uh let's first talk about our show supporters as usual peacemaker gear uh, I've been, we took ours up uh, camping. We went to family reunion uh, this last weekend. Crescent Lake. Did you have a good time? Tell me about it. Had a blast. <clears throat> Enjoyed ourselves. Took the dogs out and got to enjoy the family. And um, let's just say that it was pretty handy having our peacemaker. Putting yeah, the, now Crescent. Lid back on that. <laughs> yeah, Crescent Lake is up by Bend. Uh-huh. Schmolt. Yeah, and uh, so it's a great part of Oregon. Uh, it's pretty high up there. The water's pretty clear, although it was very nice. It was nice. still very hot. Usually once you get up to the mountains, you've got sometimes a 30-degree difference. No, 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 no. It was 100 and what? What was what did it get up to? 103 up there? Um, It felt like 103. The only difference I felt between... My phone said 103. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. the only difference I felt between there and Medford was uh, the fact that the shade did cool you down. Yes, the shade did cool you down. You could walk along the shade and you could be a lot cooler than sitting right there in the sun. Yes. 103 in Medford, the shade doesn't do shit. No, and you know what? It, that lake was very nice once <laughs> that, that sun hit you. And uh, we have some lobsters in the home. At least for a oh, couple days lobsters, we had some lobsters. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I was. I you am. Had, <laughs> so you had suntan lines underneath, like any place. That I had could... unexplainable suntan lines. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. So with the Peacemaker, though, which is what we're trying to get to, yeah. is that <laughs> it worked really well. Uh, it was very handy. Yeah, and, you know, I had to use it a couple times because I did get sick. Um, which is not uncommon for me. I got a little upset tummy sometimes. Which you is wandered a... off one morning with your peacemaker and yeah. Well, instead of a hot shower, water. <laughs> um, I was taking really cold lake baths. <laughs> yep. 
But you said you would do it and you did it. Nothing better with the silicone <laughs> pipe to do that with and a cap. So we appreciate that peacemaker. We love it. I, I use it like just all the time. Um, mm-hmm. I had to even because we slept in the back of the Jeep, which yeah. is really nice. I don't know if any of our listeners out there have Jeeps with the Cherokees, but pretty handy to flip that back up, put a nice foam pad down. Make sure you bring enough padding because that can get a little bit hard on your hips. You know, the peacemaker made it just fine. Yes, I was, but it, I just I stuffed still... it right in the little handle, the door handle area there, yep. and just stuck it right there. It was their hand. So if you are an outdoors type person like we are, do camping and hiking and any of that other good stuff that uh, just is associated with Oregon or Mm -hmm. anything in the Pacific Northwest, um, Peacemaker gear is all their stuff. Their larger pipes are nice. The smaller one that we use, the Karma is nice. The Quickie is nice. The Quickie, we do use that occasionally. So, but they're just, they're durable. They work good. And they're like, obviously water resistant. It's got the cap. Everything is just really nice about them. So I have not yet to really find anything I dislike. Even when I clean them and I don't do the recommended way, like you can just kind of squeeze. It's weird. You can kind of just squeeze that goo out. So Gross. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it you know it works. Like popping a zit, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Squeeze that out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh www.peacemakergear.com and that's P I E C E makergear.com. Don't get that confused. Check out the shop, see what they got. They got some new stuff out, and uh we'll see about maybe getting that out to our listeners too, see if we can get some of that new gear from them and get it out to the the people out there um and then of course applegate uh applegate soils and hydro uh obviously they got the big stuff the small stuff anything you need um we are wrapping up the summer in as far as dirt and soils and stuff probably but obviously indoor is still active so mm-hmm. any of your newts and stuff you can get all the different kinds of sizes there so just because summer's over doesn't mean the growing isn't over. Well, no, not the growing's over, but like the soils and stuff, the bulk of it anyway might be over. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. The majority of our flowers are I guess, are I over. guess there's a lot of um, greenhouses, so. But I do got to say, our flowers have lasted a lot longer this year. Maybe because there isn't so much heat. Yeah, except for the next like three days. I don't know if anybody's seen the weather for the Rogue Valley for the next three days. All it is is just heat. hot. That's when you go outside and the sun's like literally scorching you. You're all, okay, it's hot. There's no getting away from it. No, no. And it's just like, it is. It's like you're standing underneath the broiler. Yeah. You can feel the pain it's radiating so off the sun. You really sun. can't even, yeah, you can't even cook inside. Like you can't even turn your oven on because it's... Salads and sandwiches for the next three days. Yep. <clears throat> so... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Applegate Soils and Hydro, check them out for your newts too, because they got all different kinds of sizes, big, small, in between. It's all good. So maybe even ask for Roach. He's a great guy. He's the owner down there. He's down there during the week. So see see if he's down there and say hi. Tell him uh, Oregon Rootin. Oregon Rootin. Oregon Rootin, son. <laughs> <laughs> Oregon Rooted sent you. Uh, so moving on, we have a couple announcements I want to get out there one is if you do live in southern oregon and you like all these fairs going on this summertime jackson county finally has their fair the hemp and cannabis fair been waiting for this for a while shit we've been traveling everywhere in the state Mm -hmm. and now finally it came to us yeah so finally we got something here and uh i might try to join it sunday oh right right well well okay so it's august 20 20th 21st uh, that's at the Jackson County Expo. That's out by Central Point. Saturday, it's 10 to 6. Sunday, 11 to 5. They they say 80 plus booths, 20 plus sessions. 20 plus sessions. What does that mean? Not sure. Does that mean I get 20 I, sessions? I read. Holy shit. That's, I read the flyer and I was really <laughs> looking for what sessions meant because 20? in my mind, it means smoke sessions. That's what but I'm, I'm saying. But I'm pretty sure it probably means like maybe, like what was the Indo Expo that they were having upstairs? I don't know. What, what? Where people could go up and seminars. 
Maybe oh. it's a session, oh, like yeah. seminars. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But I was thinking the other. I was yeah. hoping the other. Right. But well, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> so they say uh, local dispensaries, local artisans, uh, which I know got a lot of good shit there. Live music at open and close and food truck. Hell yeah, food trucks. You can't have high people without food. Yeah. And then it says tools and accessories, horticulture, medicinal and recreational, hemp products, and learn, shop, and explore. Sounds pretty cool. Expo is pretty big place, so I imagine it's pretty pretty decent. And I did look up the prices. It is fourteen dollars if you buy it ahead of time, fifteen dollars at the door, and if you are a vet, you save five dollars. That's good. That's yes. nice. Um, so bring your vet card. Bring your vet card. <laughs> grow, pro, uh, grow, process, and enjoy. Celebrate. There we go. So we're going to be there. We're going to be networking and checking out and see what people got in the area and let them know what we're about. And, um, you know, just say hi. Yeah. Uh, so if you're out there, we will see you. Um, and if you see us, say hi. Maybe um, reacquaint ourselves as organ rooted rather than our old selves that we were before. What's that? Meaning now we're organ rooted. So now they see us as two different people. So we have to introduce ourselves as. Yeah. The Oregon Rooted Crew. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. Right. Um, and then the other big thing that I really want to make a big deal about is we get to go up and spend um, a, a full day at the Golden Beaver Farms. Excited about that one. We've been planning this for almost two months or, or better. Um, we've been trying to coincide it with their flowering time and their bloom, and... Uh, Does this mean I get to bring my camera? I, I I believe so. I mean, that's the... Heck yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, pending all their approvals, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they're apparently going to give us a tour of the farm, and we're going to maybe have some dinner with them, and just really enjoy probably some good folks. They yeah. seem like really good people. Uh, they practice uh, good farming practices. Maybe and... make sure their stuff isn't poisoned. We got to make sure their stuff isn't poisoned. I must. <laughs> I must. I, I imagine based on their pictures that their stuff's pretty good. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm positive. But I must try it before everybody else does. <laughs> I'm saving your lives. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like they're towards the coast, which is kind of cool. What's What's nice about Oregon is we are pretty close to the coast. We so. are. It's always within... At least a two-hour couple hour hours, yeah, yeah, and you can enjoy a part of the earth, if you will. That's pretty cool. So uh, we're gonna enjoy time with him. And... Where cannabis comes from, the earth. Yeah, and so if you're from Oregon, check them out. Golden Beaver Farms. You can find them on um, Instagram mm -hmm. and Facebook, and they are just good people that put out, uh, you know, good flour. Uh, maybe look for them in the dispensaries if you're out there and you want to try something. Something you haven't tried, if you haven't tried them yet. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have tried them, I'm sure you know how good they are. So, But if you're listening, guys, we look forward to seeing you folks. It's only a few more days and we'll be up there. So yep. good stuff. Getting there. Good times. All right, so let's move on. Let's do some news there, ladies. Tiva. All right. Uh, the first article I have is by Casey Riley from Green Rush Daily. It says, this marijuana-induced disease makes you throw up and take scalding hot showers. What the hell? This Okay, wait a second. Is this what I got? Am I talking about you? Is that, what the? I think this article is about you. Oh, my gosh. What did it give me? Just saying. Um, it's cannabinoid hype. <laughs> okay, help me with the middle word again. This is going right at the top. To I see, I know it's hi, hyperemesis, hyperemesis. Yes, I, we said for all it, you medical people out there. I think we said it there. differently earlier, but hyperemesis, hyperemesis syndrome, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. There we go. With the ever-growing rate of cannabis users around the world, medical experts are unearthing all kinds of effects associated with smoking the plant. While most of these effects are beneficial, one recent find has left cannabis enthusiasts a little worried. The discovery is of a disorder called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. The syndrome is not well understood, given how recently it was found and has left the medical community baffled. 
What we do know, however, is this. For those with the disorder, heavy cannabis use leads to uh, cyclical, almost ceaseless vomiting. That and a fondness for scalding hot showers. <laughs> we'll explain below. <laughs> Discovery. The earliest study into cannabinoid hypermesis syndrome was conducted in 2004. In it, nine patients ultimately participated in the study. The patients had two things in common, vomiting multiple times a day and an, and an affinity for smoking marijuana. When they stopped using, using cannabis, seven out of the nine saw an end to their symptoms. It appears the plant for these unfortunate individuals ha was causing the vomiting. The study also noted a very odd phenomenon. The subjects of the study all took scalding showers to alleviate their symptoms. While this works, the study notes is entirely unknown. In other words, they don't know why it helps, but it helps. Cannabinoid uh, hyperemesis syndrome, a mystery. Following the initial 2004 study, researchers have further examined the syndrome with little success. A more recent study conducted in 2012 examined 98 patients have found no new information all the patients had the syndrome as a result of heavy cannabis use which manifested in nausea uh, abdominal pain and cyclical i think that's it mm -hmm. vomiting that sounds right yes when the patient stopped smoking virtually all of them were cured of their cannabinoid syndrome and for <laughs> for reasons still unknown about half of the patients alleviated their symptoms by taking scalding hot showers um to date there's wow that is creepy yeah to date there is still little known about why a minority of cannabis users develop this syndrome what these studies have done however is aid the medical community in at the very least being able to diagnose the syndrome uh, so it can be treated. As we'll see, a misdiagnosis of the syndrome can unduly take sufferers down a long, painful road. Uh, so what's your, how do you treat it? You just stop cannabis. <laughs> what, yeah. What, what do you, that, so you can treat it? What do they mean by treat it? Like, so you quit cannabis and take a medicine to. Right. Um. I'm trying to find <laughs> if it has. I do know that I do get sick and sometimes it takes occasionally take hot showers for that. So, it, okay. Right here. It says there was a lady that basically she had a uh, third, second degree burns on 20% of her body as a result of taking showers that were far too hot for the human body. For the preceding two years, the woman had a history of daily nausea and vomiting incorrectly attributed to anxiety. Wow. Okay, this is getting a little scary. The hot showers, which the woman said helped with her symptoms, were also mischaracterized as a manifestation of obsessive compulsive disorder. As a result, she was she was on numerous medications for disorders she did not have. Eventually, doctors discovered that she, in fact, had cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome and was taken off of her medications and only instructed to quit smoking cannabis. Right. She did and was cured of the syndrome that had been plaguing her for years. Jeez. Um, I wonder if that's like an allergy of sorts. I don't know. Uh, oh. The importance of cannabis research. Um, this is the last The last one. It says cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome and the import importance of cannabis research. The federal prohibition of marijuana has no doubt contributed to the anomaly of the syndrome until so recently. Fortunately, it is now a syndrome that can be treated by professionals who know what they are looking for. However, there apparently needs to be significantly more research done on this disorder to understand better its mechanisms of action, causes, and why dangerously hot showers seem to help some with their symptoms. Federal barriers to this research cause a hindrance to this pro uh, progress that leaves some people, like the woman from the case study we looked at, suffering unnecessarily due to lack of research. Looking forward, allowing more research in cannabinoid hyperemesis <laughs> syndrome and cannabis generally will alleviate the pains of people all around the country. So actually, uh, according to Bing, I, I looked it up while you were talking, but it, it is pronounced hyperemesis. Hyperemesis. So it's just like you've been saying. And it is described or I should say defined as a severe or prolonged vomiting. 
The clinical practicability is limited by a higher degree of side effects, especially, okay, that was an example. Essentially, persistent severe vomiting leading to weight loss and dehydration as a condition occurring during pregnancy. So, it, essentially, there's so a... So, not quite you. No, but it's a, a hyperemesis is generally described as something like morning sickness for women. So... Which you sometimes, yeah... So yeah, that's you a, get that's it a, mostly in the morning. I was just curious about that word because it sounded like something specific, but really it's just a general word for prolonged vomiting. It's just prolonged sickness. It could, could yes, be for any with, reason. It could be any reason mixed why with you're cannabis. getting all that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, let me go next because I want you to finish the news. I thought this was hilarious, uh, and I don't know if this is bouncing around, but recently we just – talked about how the DEA decided not to reschedule. So we're still schedule one. And yeah, which, you know, you've got the extreme saying, oh my God, these guys are idiots. You got the other extreme saying, woohoo, great job. And then you've got in the middle where we're like, okay, well, at least they're still talking about doing studies. At least it's on there. Yeah. And, and they're going to do, they're going to fund more studies and stuff. And then there's this recent talk about how the courts are going to keep the um, government, the feds, from bothering medical patients and, and such from that aspect. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to go into that, but uh, this is recent talk. This is recent news that's going to be talked about for a bit. And I think there's a lot of reasons why they didn't reschedule. Part of it's political. A lot of it's political. But, I mean, we've got this new president coming in. Mm -hmm. Um so that's an issue we've got and what the president's going to want. We've got all kinds of things. And so I talked with, we had a um, seminar this week with Ken mm -hmm. Uh They did a seminar on terpenes, which was a great seminar. That was last night. And they talked about, you know, essentially plant oils, terpenes, what they are, what kinds, flavors, aromas, smells, what they do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of good details about them. And so as the listeners know, as you know, we're going to get together with Ken Kenavir now and they're going to talk about that seminar mm -hmm. on our show. And then also too, hopefully I can be included in this one. Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> they're going to also, Jason's going to talk with us about this, this federal, um, thing, what's going on. All right. So we're not going to go too far into it. But this does touch on it, and I think it's hilarious, uh, and it just <laughs> it highlights a, a political example here. It says, this is from Green Rush Daily, and it says, Bernie Sanders calls the DEA decision on marijuana absurd. <laughs> Senator Sanders and other Democrats have criticized the DEA's recent marijuana decision earlier this year. The DEA said in a letter that they would decide whether or not to reschedule marijuana. That's what they were doing. They did not reschedule um, they're still seeing it as the most harmful substance in America, of course. Uh, the The reasoning the DEA claims is it's because there's no currently accepted medical use in the United States, which... That's not true. I, I mean, accepted by who is the question? So they're saying, well, That's, there's there's accepted yeah. use, but not by some governing agency that they say should accept it, like, say, FDA... So what are they trying to say? That one of them should get cancer and we should try and treat their ailments with it? It'd be really great if we could take half of the DEA. And make a, and have them, a point with them. Well, no, just take half the DEA, give them epilepsy, okay, for a day. Or multiple sclerosis. And then offer them like, uh, like, a, like 20 pills they AIDS. could take. And or cannabis, which will leave it immediately. And we'll see which side of the fence they jump on. I, I right. think that would be hilarious. Be but... like, here you go. Go ahead and swallow all these. Here's some water. Yeah, and, and be aware yourself. that there's about twice as many side effects as those pills. Oh, by taking. the way, you need to take all these 20 pills to treat those 20 pills as symptoms. Yeah. So it says, it comes as no surprise that Senator Sanders is unhappy with the DEA's decision. Senator Sanders was the first major party presidential candidate ever to be in favor of rescheduling marijuana. Go Bernie. Right. Now, I mean, I don't care what you say. I mean, it doesn't matter if he, aside from him being a president, just the fact that he's someone standing up finally that high of a level 
and saying we should reschedule. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. On social media, after the DEA announcement, Sanders tweeted that keeping marijuana in the same category as heroin is absurd, which it is. Mm -hmm. Period. Period. I don't care what you think your argument is. Uh, So the time is long overdue for us to remove the federal prohibition on marijuana. Um, He followed with another tweet saying, if we're serious about criminal justice reform, we must remove marijuana from the Federal Controlled Substance Act. Then also he had tweeted, people can argue about the pluses and minuses of marijuana, but everyone knows it's not a killer drug like heroin. And everybody does. And if you don't know, I encourage you to email me at organrooted at gmail.com proven cited evidence google scholar would be good about and trust me he really enjoys this type of stuff <laughs> show him facts that yeah, he can yeah. read show me where it's more as dangerous prove as it to him i'd, I'd like it that'd is, be great yes prove it to both of us because you know what i, I welcome it too and what's funny i want to know what, what you think you know <laughs> yeah what's funny is that the federal government has already released on their national website we already covered this on our social media that they show, they've released the studies that show of theirs that show that c- cannabinoids kill or hinder cancer cells. Mm-hmm. And we put that up. You can see it. It's public information. It's out there. So this is the hypocrisy. They can say, well, it's it's the same as heroin, but yet it kills cancer or just not don't poke their you, box, okay? They live in their own little box and they enjoy it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when it gets down to Oregon, it says Democrat Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon State was the only member of the Senate to endorse Sanders' presidential bid. He explained how the DEA's decision was negatively impacting states like his own. And this is a huge one. In Oregon alone, it is estimated that the marijuana market could bring in close to half a billion dollars wow in revenue uh that's 500 million by Mm -hmm. the way all in cash right because this isn't you don't there's no banks out there for these people Mm -hmm. this is half a billion in cash being toted around okay uh and uh see all in cash during its first 14 months of legal sales right and we can't protect ourselves with that, by right? The way. Yeah, exactly. So the federal government shouldn't force Oregon's legal marijuana businesses to carry gym bags full of cash to pay their taxes, employees, and bills. So expanding access to marijuana for research is helpful, but doesn't solve these problems. It's clear now that Congress must take action to end the confusing patchwork of state and federal laws and regulations, so that businesses and states that have legalized medicinal, medicinal, and recreational marijuana can access banking services. Additional federal research can be conducted, and Veterans Affairs doctors can finally discuss medical marijuana with patients, along with maybe allowing us to have a damn gun Mm -hmm. on the property so we can protect. I have to say, it's almost like the government is driving us towards having companies as, like, fronts. Do you know oh, what yeah. I mean? Oh, well, it, it is how it is right now. Yes, That's exactly like it, how it, it is. It drives you to have another business that you can invest your money in that doesn't oh, look I see. so. Sure. Why not? Be like, I have all this money laying around because I can't deposit it into a bank account. And it's almost, it. they almost make you feel like it's illegal money. Yeah. Even though it was. <laughs> well, technically it is if you try yes, to go to a bank. Yes, but... it, it, technically it is, which is sad that you'd have to turn your money around and put it towards something else. Or but. that you're toting that much in cash, yeah, yeah. without any guns, because you might get in trouble if you're not security. Exactly. You don't so, have a badge. Yeah. So, um, I think you have one more there. Yes, um, from Dope Magazine by Megan Rubio. It says above the influence, the efficacy of cannabis DUI testing. Now I don't know. I haven't heard this article yet, but this is a big deal. I mean, like, what are we gonna do about this DUI situation? Right. Like, what would you do? Like, they can't just tell you that you're high. Blood test, urine test, whatever test they're doing, it's going to show. And it's going to show. Yeah. Whether you're high or not. Exactly. And so I, I have no idea. Let's see what let's see what it has to say. It's freezing up on me. Oh, here we go. Okay. 
Driving under the influence is not a crime that is taken lightly by anyone. In Washington State, a first offense DUI can result in jail time, a substantial fine and license suspension. This is a heavy price to pay whether you're driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Fortunately, law enforcement law enforcement enforcement has tools to measure impairment which help keep the roads safe for the public. Recently, AAA came out with a report stating that a quantitative threshold can be scientifically reported. Essentially, essentially the current measures in place for determining whether someone is driving under the influence of cannabis have no scientific basis. The concentration of THC in the blood has was not found to be an indicator for degree of impairment. What this means is that there is there are likely there are likely people being charged with cannabis DUI offenses who were not impaired while driving. Bingo. Not only that, but those who are truly impaired could be getting away with their crimes. To break things down, in Colorado, Washington, and Montana, the threshold for driving under the influence of cannabis is 5 nanograms per milliliter of THC in the blood. That is the law. Do you know how small that is? I, I know. I mean, do you realize nanograms? No, I don't realize how small it is until I actually don't okay. see it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm so guessing it is a very minimal amount. Nine zeros? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So milli, micro, nano. Milli is three zeros. Micro is six zeros. Nano is nano, nine, nine, nine decimal places. After the decimal, so point zero 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 whatever. Five. You know, see how small that is. Yep. Uh, <laughs> that is the law. By the AAA study, completely contradicts the validity of the methods for determining cannabis impairment while driving. The report goes so far as to say that there is no evidence that supports a threshold for impairment based on blood THC concentrations. As a result, those who are heavy cannabis users who also have residual THC concentrations in their blood long after use have a greater risk of being charged with a DUI even if they are not impaired. On the other hand, those who are impaired and taken to have their blood drawn may have had enough time for the THC to wear off in their system. So in other words, if you're a frequent smoker, most likely you're screwed. Um... This is a highly significant issue as the repercussions of a DUI offense are far-reaching. A first offense in Washington State could land you in jail for a year, impose a hefty fine ranging from $865 to $5,000, and result in a 90-day to one-year license suspension. It's safe to say that a DUI offense could ruin someone's life. Coupling an in in expensive fine will try... Trying to find transportation alternatives to driving can send bills skyrocketing. Drivers should not be subject to testing methods that are deemed ineffective by at measuring impairment. The best action you can take for yourself is ensuring that you're informed. Another flaw, another flaw presented by the current DUI tests, as noted by the report, is that a cannabis user has no meaningful way of knowing what their blood THC concentration is. At any point in time, with alcohol, there are always there are ways of calculating your blood alcohol level level, and it is general knowledge that the average adult body is capable of processing about one serving of alcohol each hour. The lack of scientific validity behind testing the current cannabis threshold, coupled with different cannabis consumption consumption methods, only complicate matters further. And. I mean, you don't have to go much further. No. Bottom line is this, is you cannot give a police officer any reason to suspect that you have been consuming cannabis. Right. Period. Right. Because anything beyond that, you're done for. Right. If they think you've consumed it, you have no way to protect yourself, except for $10,000 and a good lawyer and fingers crossed. Yep. Because that's it. Because right there, it just tells you. It doesn't matter if you're not a smoker, a smoker, whatever. You do it a lot. Do it. You don't know what your content is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be very high at all. And, and sometimes... it could screw you whether you are under the influence or not. So bottom line, people, listeners, this is, I guess, what I'm trying to get across is that to protect yourself is that you have to practice, uh, you know, safe 
safe practices. Yes. You if if you're going to be driving, first of all, don't get high before you go drive. Mm-hmm. Give yourself time to not be high. Okay, you can't be smoking while you're driving. Also, when you got the stuff with you, you have to have it somewhere, quote unquote, inaccessible. You, to you the can't driver. get yeah inaccessible like to the driver. Alcohol exactly in the back seat, preferably in your trunk. If if you really want to keep yourself safe and you got kids, have it in a locked box. Mm-hmm. Have it in a locked container. Have it in a container that's closed. Have it in a container that's in your um, trunk. But those things, especially a container that does not let smell out. Right. Right. And they've got these really cool turkey style bags now that don't really allow any smell out. So, you know, you don't have to have a fancy, some fancy expensive container. You can buy these, um, turkey style bags. Um, they're branded different brands, but, um, Mm -hmm. that you can throw that stuff in and it won't smell. And that's another thing to think about. So you don't want your car to smell. You don't want it easily accessible so that even if things go really south and a cop pulls you out and still busts you for a DUI, that 5k that you're spending on a lawyer that lawyer can protect you that lawyer can say look bs it was inaccessible to the driver mm-hmm. it was purposely put in this locked box because they were traveling mm-hmm. he, he's the the lawyer he or she i should say has the ability to protect you because you've done certain things that show that you were not trying to consume it right. while or during or before driving uh so i guess that's it um yeah. because that's the only way you're gonna protect yourself if you're smoking while you're driving I have nothing for you. Yep. You you just you're gonna run a risk. Basically, the the last I just wanted to read the last mm-hmm. part Go of ahead. this particle. It particle. Sa- particle. Cool. Article. Uh, it says any states looking to legalize or pass medical laws should l- look to this report when drafting policies in an effort to protect individuals and the public at large. In other words, do your research. Make sure you know what you know. Know everything. Know the legal rights and everything. Identifying those who are truly impaired from those who are not should be a priority for policymakers and law enforcement officials. Much like with alcohol, if the public understands that the effects of cannabis and or, and its duration, they can take steps to to mitigate the prevalence of impaired driving. Yeah. Just like you were saying in layman's terms. Yeah. And part of knowing your rights is that there's certain things and believe me i'm not a lawyer i'm not handing out advice right i'm only telling you that there are options if you do consult lawyers certain things like you do not have to take a sobriety test okay there are consequences for that i do believe most states will probably suspend your license for about a year but if you're impaired and you in basically you have Basically, you're going to get a DUI if you take that sobriety. You're better off just taking a suspension right there. Mm-hmm. Skip the sobriety. Don't say nothing. Say you want to talk to your lawyer. And then call I a did lawyer. Not know that. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's the same thing. Even if you take a sobriety and they still want to bust you because you didn't pass the sobriety, you can go in to take your breathalyzer and you don't have to take that breathalyzer. Mm-hmm. You can refuse it. Now, but you would take the suspension. You take the suspension. Okay. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's all, all I'm saying is that don't let the police make it seem like you only have one option, and that's to do what they want you to do. Right. A lot of these situations, they're asking you to do things in a voluntary manner, and you do have rights to answer in other ways than just, yes, sir. Well, just like so, the Miranda rights, they ask you at the end, do you understand the rights, rights that have been read to you? Yes. And there if is, you say no. Yeah. Well, I mean. They have to find out a way to, pre- to present themselves better. Well, I mean, bottom line is that uh, just know that there's reasons why they have to give you Mirandas and there's reasons why you should be aware of your rights. So. Mm-hmm. Be aware of them. Find a lawyer before this all goes down. Maybe carry a lawyer's card around, a lawyer that you like, that you talk to. Right. Even sit down and consult with one if if cannabis is normal in your life and these are concerns. So, yeah. Anyway, there you go. (laughs) That's my soapbox for DUIs. And the only reason I bring all this up is just because it's such a big deal. I mean, Mm -hmm. these. it's almost like the government has went from, okay, we used to put you in jail or even in prison for having cannabis in your possession. Well, now that's legal. So what we'll do is we'll just put you in jail. 
for consuming cannabis and driving. It's just another way that they've found to take legal cannabis. Right. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say go get high and drive. That's not what I'm saying. But if they're going to enforce that law, there has to be some standards. There has to be some real evidence. There can't just be, what is it, five nanograms? Mm -hmm. Five nanograms. I mean, you know how, you don't even know how small that is. It's just incredibly small. So let's wrap up the rest of the half of the show here with what I talked about. This is beneficials for IPM, and that's essentially integrated pest management. Now, this will be the last big episode on this for this season until mm-hmm. we get into the indoor, indoor grow. Um, but we want to talk about it. This is geared towards organic growers. This is geared towards people that only want to use beneficials to combat the the pests. This goes hand in hand with like what Kenover Research is saying, trying to stick away the pesticides, trying to stay mm-hmm. away from those. Right. I, I agree with all this, so this is why I want to share this info. I encourage you, if you really are interested, to grab a pencil on this and paper because this is too much just to remember. You can always refer back to the show, but even then, just if you refer back to it, no, you're probably going to have to write this stuff down because it's just it's crazy. Okay? Mm-hmm. So this comes from – the information comes from Evergreen Grower Supply and also uh, – Evergreen Grower Supply, and also by Applied Bionomics Limited. So both those places contributed to this information. Okay, so cannabis or marijuana, as we know, is grown for human consumption, and therefore every effort should be made to grow the crop without use of potentially harmful pesticides. Using beneficial insects and natural fungi is the key to eliminate pests in the best way to ensure cultivation of a clean and quality product. Mm-hmm. Um, intensive modern breeding programs for medicinal characteristics have shifted cultivation from traditional outdoor environments toward protected indoor environments. And because of that, choosing to work indoors gives growers the ability to grow cannabis year round and at a faster rate, but it also leaves these crops more susceptible to damaging pests. I mean, you're creating a really nurturing environment and you're eliminating the possibility of natural pests that would normally be out there. In other words, you're putting out a welcoming mat. Kind of, if you get an infestation, because there's really, one, there's not a, there's, you're creating a perfect environment to begin with and then mm-hmm. there's just no natural, unless you introduce these predatory pests, they're not going to be in there if you get an infestation. So. Right. Because cannabis has been mostly cultivated as a field crop, indoor growers often experience stressed plants, which attract fungal pathogens and insect pests. I think that's why we ended up getting PM on our one plant, mm-hmm. is because we did stress, the, I stressed the plants for a few days there when my pH got off. Hmm. And um, yeah, and I think that's when we picked it up. So right. a good example there. Thank you. I appreciate I, I love setting examples like that. Learning from experience. <laughs> So let's start here. Prior to planting, this is where you want to start your IPM, okay, right from the beginning. Preventative action against pests is crucial when preparing a cannabis cultivation area. So cleaning the area thoroughly with detergent is recommended. Remove all your old plant material, obvious residues from fungal or anything like that, and any non-essential apparatus from the grow area. So tools, stuff like that, you got to go. Be sure to wash any previously used tools and clothing and avoid cross-contamination. So climate is also a key element when preparing cannabis growing conditions. Due diligence is needed to ensure that air circulation is sufficient. Now, Jay Bird has talked about this in his episode, Mm -hmm. and it's key. So inside, especially air circulation, air circulation, air circulation, and by the way, more air circulation. (laughs) And you'll see a lot of people that just got their plants are just blowing. So, uh, you want to try to mimic outdoors is, is essentially what you're doing. And, um, so if the grow issues had passed the pest before, um, one good thing you can do is, is put some bush beans out, mm-hmm. bush bean plants. They attract all kinds of pests and that you can literally attract the pests to the, the plants and then throw the whole plant out with the pests. It, it literally works really good. For best results, don't buy plants at a store. Instead, plant the bush beans from seed. Strike and provider 
are the two best varieties, Strike and Provider of the bush beans. Hmm. Um, and these will clean up any pests that may what be What exactly is a bush bean? It's like like the viney beans, that the, the little green beans. Oh, okay. They're green beans. Okay. You know? Bush beans. They're just the bush beans. They don't grow long. Okay. They're viney, but they're more compact. And okay. I, I was just asking. Yeah, they're beans. Just curious. Uh, but they attract all these bugs for some reason. So what you can do is you can clean your room, throw the bush beans in there, throw a couple little ones, and they'll attract whatever's left in there. And then you just toss that whole damn thing out. Gone. Right. Done. Gone. Hmm. That's good to know. So when planting begins and the pots are first watered, a predatory soil mite, such as stratiolelaps, stratiolelaps, should be applied to the soil surface at a rate of 10 to 12.5 mites per square foot. Hmm. Got that? These soil mites will control fungus gnat larvae in the root zone, leading to a faster growth rate and healthier plants. And gnat, fungus gnats are pretty common with people, especially beginners, because a lot of beginners tend to overwater, and that's what creates that moist soil, which creates fungus gnat issue. And fungus gnats, adults, and the flying ones don't really hurt anything. It's the larvae mm-hmm. in the soil that hurt, hurt your roots, which is hmm. unfortunate. But um, So... The stratiolelaps also feed on pupating thrips larvae, helping thrips management by breaking the reproductive cycle. If despite reasonable prevention, the crop ends up with a spider mite problem, apply more stratiolelaps to the floor area, focusing on cracks and any other breaks in the floor where the spider may, mites may hide. Was it thrips that we had last year? No, it was mites. It was mites. Yeah, but we had control of them. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but we had control of them, but I just remember you kept cursing uh, at them. You know, well, let me tell you, it's just, once you get them, it's really hard to totally get rid of them. So you just have to stay on top of it. But we brought that in with dirt. That pissed me off. Yeah. Screw that, that dirt. dirt. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, wasn't that the cheap stuff at Walmart? <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I only mixed a couple bags in as filler and it just just it was bad news don't even well i think we learned our lesson when we started to plant just a regular flower and i found plastic in the dirt that pissed me off so bad i was like what is this yeah (laughs) that's one thing is i mean even as a beginner grower i can't stress enough that it's it's cheap to grow a plant but you don't want to skimp on quality Right. So yes, you can throw a marijuana seed in dirt, throw a little water on it, and it grows. Oh, I that is so true. Very simple. Mm-hmm. But, but, starting with good dirt, starting with a few basic good nutrients, those are really good building blocks to a successful grow. Right. And so know that if you're going to jump into it and you're a beginner, realize that there is going to be some investment if you want to be successful. Because, mm-hmm. yes, you can take some shit dirt and a seed and grow it. I don't know if you're going to make it to the end. I don't know. They grow like weeds. It, very very possible. You might not get a lot of quality and you might not get a lot of volume. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just know if you want to grow good medicine and enough to support the actual growth process financially – there's going to be some investment because you really want to get good dirt. You really want to get good newts and you want to get a good grow space, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, for air rooting systems, there are not a lot of, uh, well, no, let me, yeah, let me start over from there. When growers have established spider mite issues, uh, Gallandromus occidentalis, the occidentalis might be their best option as they feed primarily on spider mite nymphs, you know, see, I want, yeah, let's, let's keep on talking about the, um, the air rooting system. I'm sorry. So let's step back there. So for air rooting systems, there are not a lot of predators or pests that have adapted to this style of propagation. We recommend that this area has at least some rove beetles is what they're called. So mm-hmm. Delodia coriaria, these should be present at all times. This flexible beetle is an excellent flyer, tolerates virtually aquatic situations, all aquatic situations, and is always hungry. It tends to stay in the structure and resides in the drain system, so only periodic applications are needed to maintain a presence. 
as soon as true leaves are present, growers, this, so we're starting from the beginning, by the way. Mm -hmm. So from seedling up. So now we are at uh, true leaves here. Once they're present, growers should then apply a, what's called a philosis. That's amblesius mm -hmm. philosis at a rate of two mites per square foot, which is not a lot. Uh, Philosis is a spider mite generalist that's also capable of controlling broad mites, which is huge in Oregon, mm -hmm. and other microscopic mites. If a grower has a history of broad mites, they should double the rate of Philosis and make sure they're in as soon as possible, of course. Once the plant begins to grow the flower head and stickiness begins, all of the predatory mites will avoid those areas. Okay? Hmm. So, yeah. Which I wasn't sure about that, but apparently they do. So, and of course, yellow sticky traps, throw those up, apply those at about a rate of. Which is what we have the yellow sticky yeah, traps. Yeah, this is yeah. common. Most growers use them. If you're brand new, sticky traps, apply them one for every 500 square feet. Actually, I apply more than that. I almost sometimes do, like, say I've got four plants, I'll put two or three out. Just curious. When it, when you were saying that the one that you apply it to the area so the 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 mites avoid it, can you put it all over the plant and or would they move farther up the plant? Well, they're only avoiding stickiness from the resin. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's from the plant. Okay. Which is I I, I think that's probably part of what resin is on marijuana. Like it's like the, their own defense. Yeah, it's part of insect repellent. Uh, well, because insects like most sunscreen. of the time don't want to get stuck on it, and so it's sticky. Yeah, yeah, that and oh, it just deters okay. them. And it, part cool. of, part of that is terpenes in there. I, you know, because you weren't there to hear it, but those terpenes that are in, it's weird. Jason was basically saying that you can take one bud from from say this section of the plant and measure the profile, and you'll get one profile. Uh -huh. And then you take another section of the plant and measure the profile, and it's completely different. And the I know that he was saying that also with the bio. The yeah, and the, the thing about that is, it's like the plant is an ever changing, morphing organism that's responding to the environment in all parts of the, itself. So you yeah. can think of it like having hands and fingers, and each finger is responding to the environment, you know, accordingly for insect repellents, or maybe it needs more UV protection right there, mm -hmm. or maybe it whatever. And so those profiles are changing to communicate or work with the environment. It's crazy. Well, and just like he also said, I think about testing is what it was, is that you can test the same the same product that you get and you can come up with different results because of how different the plant yeah. can be. Yeah, and so it's... I remember that's what yeah. you were saying. It's, it's true. It's straight interviews. across the board with all those numbers. And the one thing is, is so if you want to bring a plant in and you want to know its terpene profile, especially for medical use. Unfortunately, that bud is going to be different than the next bud that you might test on that same plant. On the same plant, yes. Because now, of how yeah, different the plant and, is. Yeah. And so, and then it also gets in more detail where that the chemistry of the person and their endocannabinoid system is going to receive that profile different than you. Yes. Each person, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and what's really cool is that like the first, the most common terpene, and and what do you think the most number one common terpene is in nature? Without yeah. too much airspace, there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not mint. sure. I, mint. mint. Okay. okay. What's the second most? You won't know. It's called limonene, or lime, limonene, limonene, Lim limonene, and it's the second most common, and it is found in marijuana that's one of the hmm. most common terpenes found in marijuana but it's also the second most common in nature <laughs> under mint the other one was um chemically this is how crazy terpenes are so if you take the chemical compound for what was it uh dill like the dill, taste like, yeah. the flavor of huh. dill that so that terpene that represents the flavor of dill. If you look at the chemical structure, it, it looks like think of a picture of a of an of a molecule. Remember mm -hmm. chemistry and you had the little molecule you'd draw? Yeah. Well think of that. Now if you mirror that chemical image, just mirror it, it changes into spearmint. Hmm. 
Isn't that crazy? Yeah, how close Dylan so is from this, mint. Ex it's exactly the same exact molecule just flipped. Hmm. So you can go from dill to spearmint just by just mirroring that, that chemical hmm. structure. That's crazy. Yeah, which is really weird. Yeah. yeah. Terpenes are crazy. And so just moving on real quick. So common pests that we talked about. Now, we just talked about what you want to do when you start your plants. You want two different uh, uh, predatory um, beneficials. That's the rove beetles and what was it called? The stratiolalaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's starting. Now, let's talk about common pests. And we just mentioned them, spider mites. These are nasty. Mm -hmm. One of the most common, one of the most hardest to deal with. In a dry environment, spider mites are the most common and serious pest. Spider mites hate high humidity. If the plants are not battling botrytis or similar molds, try misting the affected areas on a regular schedule for a few days. Literally, what you can do is take a sprayer, like a one or a two gallon sprayer, and literally spray just water. They hate water. They don't like it. You can literally give them a bath. I've even heard of growers taking smaller plants that are inside plants and literally washing them in the bathtub upside down. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? To wash off the spider mites. <laughs> but it does work. Um, I wish it were that easy for some other things. Right. Um, so as mentioned above, you can use the stratiolalaps that can be used to prevent spider mite problems from developing. Uh, and this pest will go after spider mites in the soil, which is cool. Phalasis, phalasis, I'm not sure how to say that one, can also be used to take preventative action against spider mites. Apply phalasis at a rate of two mites per square foot. This predatory mite even establishes itself throughout the crop, preventing spider mites under normal conditions. Hot spot outbreaks should be treated with persimilis. Now, I don't know if, if anybody's treated with beneficials. They probably recognize the name persimilis. Phalasis and persimilis are compatible and do not interfere with each other. However, phalasis does not do well on spider mite webbing, okay, while persimilis thrives on it. And I hope that if you are not to that point, if you are to the point of webbing on spider mites, you are in... You've let it go too long. Bad news. Bad news. Um, and then moving on. Uh, Mesocyalis, Mesocyalis long pipes, or we'll just call them long pipes. How's that? is similar to persimilis, but can tolerate lower humidity. The optimum conditions for these predators require higher humidity as the temperature increases. Long pipes are most effective in warm greenhouses and interior scapes with artificial lighting. Release long pipes at a rate of three per square foot, once a week, one to two times. Got it? Another predatory mite that works best when used preventatively against spider mites is the neo Salus californicus. So hmm. californicus. Growers will see best results when californicus is allowed to build up before the spider mite populations are able to establish themselves. Californicus is tolerant of various temperatures and low humidity, but works best under warm to hot conditions. So it tolerates higher temperatures and lower humidity than persimilis. When pest populations are low, Californicus will feed on pollen, which helps predatory populations around the crop, or I should say keeps predatory populations around the cop crop. While some predators will actively seek out new prey in the absence of food, most will stay on the crop and wait for the arrival of new pests, which is really cool mm -hmm. with those guys. So, and then Andersoni, again, people have heard of Andersoni before if you've used beneficials. The Amblyseus andersoni is another predatory mite that can be used to control spider mites and a range of other mite pests. It's great for broad mites as well. Uh, again, best results apply when these mites' numbers are low, So, which is true anyway. Mm -hmm. Always try to get a, in control of it from the beginning. Um, and spider mites, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but for beginners out there, they leave these little white or like really light yellow pin in holes almost mm -hmm. and they just they checker your lower leaves so check for those little white spots on lower leaves that's a good indication um, and that's the other thing too is when you're treating all this stuff with these beneficials remember that trimming the bottom 10 to 20 percent of right. your larfy Avoids. leaf gets rid of a lot of that stuff because that's yeah. where they hide out at and they really don't like 
camping out on the top. So if you get rid of that stuff, then it helps a lot. So um, Andersoni, you can purchase that in a shaker bottle or sachet, which is a lot of them are in sachets. Uh, if using the shaker bottle, just gently shake the Andersoni under the crop near the flowers. Uh, just two or three predator mites per 10 square feet. Again, that's not very much. Um, sachet should always be shaded from direct sunlight, of course, and then introduced at two meter spacing along the crop row. Um, apply to any convenient location on the plant, such as a leaf, petiole, twig, or small branch. Duration of the sachet activity is about six weeks, so remember that. Hmm. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there you go. Uh, moving on, when growers have an established spider mite issue, so now we're saying it's established. Yes, it's you, there. It's so there. The webs. Yeah, you can use what's called Occidentalis. That's what I was getting at earlier, and I and I jumped too far ahead, but mm -hmm. this is when it gets started getting serious. So the Occidentalis might be their best option as they feed primarily on spider mite nymphs and adults, just not eggs. The Occidentalis is a very versatile predatory mite and will tolerate the high temperatures and low humidity well. This biological control is recommended for greenhouses with a relative humidity of, say, 40% or less. It is native to California and has been used to control spider mites, two-spotted mites, russet mites, of course, and others. Adults eat one to three pests, and uh, adults eat up to six pests' eggs per day as well. So, um, let's see, apply... Adults eat one to three pests. Adults, yeah. So apply Occidentalis upon arrival at a rate of two to three per square foot by weekly, one to two applications. So, hmm. um, but here's the deal with the Occidentalis. It needs like those guys need like eleven hours of daylight, which I don't get. So I don't know that you can use those all season outside. Right, right. Um, if if you're growing indoors, yeah. Indoors, you're good, absolutely. But so just remember on those, they're a little beefier. They eat more, and they'll handle or a bigger infestation. But man, eleven hours of daylight, so probably inside on that. Mm -hmm. And then Stethorus punctillum um, is a tiny black beetle that can be used. It thrives in low humidity situations. If growers are unable to manage the climate effectively and the spider mite conditions are extreme. The Stethorus could save the crop. It, it should be applied at a rate of 0 0.1 per square foot in extreme cases or in moderate cases at a rate of 0 0.01 per square foot. These beetles find spider mites by smell, which is interesting, and quickly move to new infestations, leaving behind their eggs. What do they smell like? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it doesn't seem like they smell good. They smell like crabs. <laughs> Um, yeah, so one advantage of the Stethorus, though, is that they can fly plant to plant to eat, right? That's kind of creepy, but cool. Mm -hmm. They're sensitive to insecticide and miticide, so be aware of that. And then the stickiness of the flowers, though, will not deter these guys. So, yeah, that's yeah. good. Um, another option is uh, to prevent pests is, and this gets... It's an insecticide, but it's a bio-insecticide, so I, I consider this part of it. Another option is MET-52. Um, this is a contact bio-insecticide, and it uses pathogenic fungus in an emulsified oil for effective control of thrips. It'll take roof aphids out, russet mites, broad mites, and more. Uh, MET-52 should be applied in the early stages, though, of population development. MET-52 product efficacy and impacted by coverage and the application frequency is influenced by the environment, the manner of application, foliar drench, and the population of the target pest, of course. So, um, Preferol is a microbial insecticide. That's good for spider mites. It's a naturally occurring mm -hmm. fungus. Um, it can take foliage and soil-dwelling insects out, such as white flies, aphids, thrips, spider mites, and other pests. Mm-hmm. Um, the best results using preferol is in integrated, which I think that is pretty much with anything, you know, mm -hmm. not just one single thing, but integrated in some kind of multi, you know, got all kinds of things going on instead of just one thing. So, um, 
so I mean, so that would include things, I guess, like, uh, you know, scouting, monitoring the, the sticky cards I talked about, right. um, early detection, if you can find it using a loop, uh, get a jeweler's loop if you don't have much money and just identifying those guys. Um, and then the pest pressure, just monitor that, you know, you don't want to get that big infestation. You do not want spider mites getting freaking webs on your, mm-hmm. your, your right, junk. Right. Um, so yeah. Um, let's see, fungus gnats, that's the other common one. Stratiolet laps can use to control that. Um, of course, you want to apply that before it gets big, of course, when they're still low. The reason is, is because with fungus gnats, uh, it's, if you see them, the adults flying around, that means the larva is in the dirt and the larva is what's eating your roots. Right. So that's the problem. It's not the flying adults. It's the damn babies eating your shit in the ground. <laughs> Feeding off of it. Yeah. So um, you can do two applications of the stratiolalaps per crop cycle and are usually sufficient if used early in the season. The second application should be made two to three weeks after the first. Okay. Pretty simple. It's like shots. Yeah, kind of. And then rove beetles can also be used to control fungus gnats in the soil or planting media. We talked about these. Rove beetles are most effective when applications are started before fungus gnat population becomes well established. We keep saying that. <laughs> I've heard that like six times. <laughs> yeah, just that's just it. Um, Nemesis. Nemesis is a good one. It's a beneficial nematode product. I don't know if people have heard of that. It helps provide biological control of fungus gnats. The beneficial nematodes stenernema. It's these words are hard for me. The stenernema feltiae are microscopic worms that attack and kill targeted insects without affecting any other organisms. Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. Just that word nematode is creepy. Like nematode sounds like something off of like some, you know, October scary movie. Like, don't let the nematode get you. Is it a nematode? No. It's a worm. Okay. Yeah. What are what are the things at the bottom um, that you used to catch, like the lizards at the bottom of the ponds? What are those called? What do you use to catch the lizards at the bottom no, of the pond? No, what were I used to catch the lizards that were at the bottom of the pond? I just don't. They were mud, mud salamanders, dogs. salamanders, mm-hmm. mud dogs. That's there. Never mind. I was mud thinking dogs. maybe they were nematodes, but <laughs> I put the wrong word. Yeah, that's funny. Um... So, um, another one, uh, aphids, aphids, we know about these aphids are attracted to soft new plant growth. Aphids themselves seldom cause permanent damage, but their excrement honeydew, which is what they call that. That's disgusting. Can lead to mold. Basically honeydew also attracts ants. That's probably why they call it that. When aphids are an issue, eliminate any ants first. Ants farm aphids so they can feed on the honeydew. Can you believe that shit? Gross. They will protect the aphids from predation and sometimes actively move aphids around to greener pastures. Go ants. <laughs> this tree's bigger. Let's go here. Yeah. Once the ants are gone, aphids can easily be controlled by using the predatory midge called aphid, aphidemiza. Aphidemiza. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a rate of 0.01 per square foot weekly until the aphids are eliminated. If there's a history of aphids, continue at this rate weekly for the duration of the crop. When the aphid populations are high, you can use a biological called Aphidius colomani. Use it alone will not provide adequate control, but they will work well in conjunction with the aphidolites and the ladybugs to provide control. So you can hmm. use ladybugs with them. So these species are a group native to parasitic wasps. Ooh, that's just even creepier. Frequently found per- parasitizing aphids in greenhouses and outdoor crops. The adults are tiny little dark colored wasps that do not sting. I wonder if that's the ones that fly around your head and shit. Huh? You know, the ones that bother you. Yeah. Um, pretty creepy. The larvae develop entirely inside the host aphid, which eventually becomes rigid mummies when the larvae pupate. <laughs> Ew. All right, let's move on to the nasties, root aphids. Root aphids are insidious and can be difficult to diagnose and observe. The predatory soil mite, stratiolalaps, we got back to this one, 
controls root aphids and weevils, but only first and second in star larvae. Using these mites to control an existing problem would take a long time. Applying stradiolalaps when the plants are first rooted is one of the best ways to manage root aphids. So like we said, right from the beginning, these should be applied just to prevent right. all this stuff. Rove beetles, again, work well. Um, one application of the Atheta per crop cycle is usually sufficient if started early in the season. Again, Met 52 and Prefer All are good for that as well. Um, thrips, those are the tiny little slender insects capable of limited flight and cause damage similar to that of spider mites. So they do leave little like kind of white spotted stuff. It's weird. Um, so thrips tend to scrape the leaf surface while spider mites pierce the leaf tissue and extract the chlorophyll. Those <laughs> vampires. There are many different species of thrips that can cause potential damage to cannabis crops. Pests include the greenhouse thrips, the western flower thrips, and the onion thrips. Yellow and blue sticky traps can be effective, of course. Um, essentially for the adults, the trapping rate can be increased by a factor of 10 by attaching a cotton ball to the sticky trap and adding a few drops of vanilla or almond extract to the cotton ball. Bet you didn't know that. Nope. Good to know. Yeah. We also offer other various lures that work the same way the cotton ball method would. Beans are also very attractive to thrips, allowing both early detection and possibly a better target. The predatory mite Cucumeris, Amblesius cucumeris, is the best biological control to combat thrips. These mites attack the first and second instar larvae. If enough cucumeris are present, they are extremely effective, and they will take those bad boys out. Uh, the presence of stradiolalaps in the soil will effectively reduce the cycling of those thrips by up to 80%. So both those can be used. Uh, yeah. Um, so we're almost done. Um, basically, uh, again, with thrips, like I said, in MET52, Nemesis both work. Uh, you can get granular or EC formulations of the MET52. Um, I don't know if people knew that. Nemesis is a beneficial nematode, of course, that's going to help provide biological control of the western flower thrips. And those can be applied at a rate of 50 million per thousand square feet. <laughs> Break that one down. It's a lot of guys hanging out. Yeah, so here's something interesting. When a thrip problem gets overwhelming, growers can try using a large tub filled with a soapy solution to attract and kill large numbers of adult thrips. The tub should be yellow or white and measure about 18 inches long, 12 inches wide, and about 6 inches deep. In the tub, make a solution of mostly water and a small amount of dish soap. Adding vanilla or almond extract can also help attract the pests. Hmm. Adult thrips will be drawn to the tub for as long as it keeps its scent, which is usually about three days. If this method proves successful, growers may want to repeat the process until it is no longer an issue. Woot woot. Hmm. So, broad mites, hemp russet mites, and... Eurifid, Eurifid mites? I can't say that very well either. In recent years, broad mites, russet hemp mites, and the Eurifid mites have caused many headaches for cannabis cultivators, especially some, some of these guys in Oregon here. Um, mostly found in indoor crops. Leaves and stems are affected, and they can become greasy and then turn a bronze color. Um, unfortunately, symptoms don't usually show up until after the plants have matured and it's become an issue. So the phyllosis can be used to prevent um, and control those Is broad that a mites. dinosaur? Phyllosis? Yeah, phyllosis raptor. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's how you say it too. I should have looked that up. But um, As soon as true leaves are present, apply the phyllosis at a rate of two mites per square foot. If there's a history of broad mites, double the rate. Make sure it's applied as soon as possible. Um, while cucumeris is the best biological control when it comes to thrips, they can also be used as a preventative measure against the immature stage of broad mites as well, or hemp russet mites, or the ureophyte mites. If russet hemp mites are already present, Andersoni is a good one. Um, works works good. Um, it says the predatory mites will then be able to feed on small colonies of mites and prevent them from growing and causing major damage. 
Californicus is a general mite predator that can also be used as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Swirsky. Hmm. Ambiceus Swirsky are excellent beneficial mites that go after broad mites as well. They're a good option for warmer growing areas as Swirsky become inactive when temperatures drop below 59 degrees. So probably good for our hot summers here. Again, MET52 and Preferol are good ones for this situation. Uh, and then we'll just move into white flies here. White flies is a co- is not a common pest um, in cannabis because uh, these pests tend to adapt to. Um, it is important to be on because these <laughs> because these pests tend to adapt is important to be on the watch for them. So even though they're not a problem with cannabis, they can be, and they tend to adapt like it's saying. So be careful. The white fly is a close relative to the aphid, and both of them can cause major devastation on cannabis crops. Uh, hmm. Both pests create that honeydew, of course, which is creates mold. And if any white fly is seen on yellow sticky cards, begin releasing the parasitic wasp, hmm. the Formosa, Encarcia Formosa wasp. Get that bad boy send out at a rate of 0.1 per square foot weekly kick some butt and then in the same fa- in the same family is the eremius which can also be used to control a wi-fi problem the uh a wi-fi problem the white fi- fly problem <laughs> yeah uh it originates in the desert regions of Arizona and California and is able to tolerate high temperatures. So if you're in a real hot area, this is a good one. And it can be used together to control silver leaf and greenhouse white flies. Hmm. Um, and then Delphastus is good for white flies. Um, that's good for high density, bad problems of white flies. Um, and it prefers to feed on white fly eggs, so you can get um, good control on that. Now, um, it, it mentions here, it's funny because it, it, it even mentions Azagard or Azamax, Azadiractin. I mm-hmm. use that one myself. Right. Yeah, and it's it's funny. It's it's an insect growth regulator, but it, it's essentially it. Um, it's the concentrated extract of neem oil. And it doesn't smell, and it does work good. I'm very happy with it. I, it's my plants always look better after I've sprayed them with it. But that is a good one, and it it can control over 300 plus insects, and it works great. It, it'll knock out uh, a, a mite problem fairly well if you incorporate it in some sort of program. Um, but again, that's not really what I'd consider anything hard or extreme. Um, it's, I guess it's not a biological, but, uh, it's, uh, it's just a growth regulator on those bugs. Mm -hmm. So it, it keeps them from making love and making babies. Right. So, um, and again, we had mentioned that you can use things like bush beans, use those to attract, like if you've got a problem, what you can do is start spraying, but you can also put bush beans out and those will attract Attract any balance. And you can just literally take those and completely throw those out. Yeah. So we mentioned, I don't know, five or six or seven good beneficials. I know that was a little long in terms of that section. I hope that if you are interested in stuff, getting that deep into your pest control problems, I hope that you learned something from that. Right. Right. Um, because those are the ones to use. Yeah. And there'll be local stores that you can call and um, talk to about those particular beneficials Mm -hmm. and to be able to get them and such. But if you want to stay away from pesticides and stuff like that, this is what you're going to have to do. And you're going to have to hit it early and often and use those bad guys in your, your, your grow. So, okay. Well, I don't have any more. Do you have anything for us, Lady Sativa, to finish up? Not really. Okay. So we are done with episode 12. We appreciate it. Um, We are going to come back next week with tons of stuff. We're still, I've got to talk to Right to Grow, which is coming up on Friday. I've also, we're going to have a full session with uh, Golden Beaver. 
Mm-hmm. So we'll have that next week. Plus, I'm sitting down with Kenevere Labs on their seminar. So right. we've got three major interviews coming up. Uh, that we're will to bring on a couple more. Yeah. So uh, lots of good stuff coming up on the interview side. So we appreciate you folks, and we will see you on the flip side. Organ love. Organ love.